Good morning. Good to be with you this Sunday morning. And looking forward to opening the Word of God together. We live in a we live in a culture that's turned upside down. Last three weeks we've been looking at that. We've been living it in 220. Been watching the world, seeing the things that are taking place around the world and here in the United States. And we really see just a real change, a sea change taking place. We don't know where it's going to go. We don't know what things are going to take place. We don't even know what's going to happen the rest of this year. But we know things are upside down. As we deal with life and, and we look at our country, we deal with relationships in our life, things get more difficult, not easier. We've looked the last three weeks at uh, the significance, the importance of having relational ministry, reaching into people's lives, reaching into the people in your own world, in your own life for Christ. How to do that, how to engage people in a world that's just getting tougher and tougher relationally. How do we engage them for Christ? How do we do that in such a way and show grace and show love? Well, we're going to continue from those last three weeks and move into a series that I'm excited about. We finished with the book of John, the Gospel of John, about a month ago. We saw in that book the, the emphasis on Jesus Christ as the Son of God, our Savior. And Jesus Christ came and he did the works of his Father. He presented the ministry of his Father. He presented God the Father to us. He modeled the essence and nature of God before us as human beings. He went to the cross and he loved us to the very end. And so we see the ministry of Christ just, just come alive. And that life is in, the, light, is in the, the life of every believer, that abundant life and just that, the reality of Jesus Christ in us. And so we saw that ministry and we see it's the fruit of that ministry in our life. What I want to do is I want to take a, 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 an approach that, that starts with John, the Gospel of John, and put the other book in on the other end. Also looking at the, the same author, the one who wrote the Gospel of John, looking at the book of Revelation. John also wrote the book of Revelation. It's a bookend. It's, it's the complete picture. It's the, it's the other side of the coin. It's the end of the story. And I want to take a look at that. I want to look, I want to look at a Revelation and remind us that uh, God is in control. We have a world that seems upside down. We have relationships that sometimes seem upside down. And this is a reminder to us that God's in control. And He has a plan. He's unchanging. The very Savior who was revealed in the Gospel of John is the very Savior who now is in control in Revelation. I want this to be an encouragement to you. So we're going to look at this. Let's just consider Revelation for a moment. There are many things of significance. There are many challenges that we that are there when we think about Revelation. It's, it's an intimidating book. Uh, it's, it's, it's a book that's Often, often we feel like you know it's just it's just too hard to understand. There's just too many things in there. I don't I don't understand. I can't I can't get a grasp of. Sometimes we come to the book of Revelation, we just feel like you know what? There's just there's so many approaches to Revelation, so many opinions, so many points of view. I don't even know how to land. I don't know I don't know where I'm at. I don't know what to make of the book. How to how to even bring it uh, into my life with with meaning that I'm certain about. Um, there's so much symbolism in the book of Revelation. How do I handle that? I, how do I handle the, the word pictures that are, that are there? Uh, and there's just, there's just so much uncertainty that's there. And, I, and how, do, how do I just have confidence as I walk through the book of Revelation? Um, sometimes we have this sense that Revelation is, is just not about the here and now. It's, it's something that's going to take place down the road. We're going to be out of the picture as Christians. So, so what's the difference? What's it matter? We're going to see in the book of Revelation, it's, it's supremely important to the life of a believer right now in 2020. I'm looking forward to showing how that's true, the reality of that. We're going to see Christ all the way through. It's important. Revelation is the only book, the only whole book, that has a blessing, the blessing upon reading that book, for hearing that book, for uh, living that book. The book of Revelation gives to the reader, gives to us, the believer, a blessing from this specific book that no other book of the Bible does. The emphasis really that comes from the book of Revelation is the transformative work of Christ. It is, it is, it is a, the transformation of history. It's the culmination of everything that we see that takes place. Revelation really is our Lord transforming history. It's the transformation of history. So we're going to see that. I'm excited about that. Uh, it touches my life today and right now, and it'll touch yours too. It's an opportunity to remind us that we need to reach people for Christ right now in this year, 2020. 
Let's remember that John wrote this book. He wrote it in 95 AD. He was exiled on Patmos, the island of Patmos, Patmos. And he was, um, it's a penal colony. It's for the worst of, of prisoners, those who, who were defiant to the emperor, to Emperor Domitian of Rome, uh, who were the worst of the criminals. John here is there because of his identi identity with Christ. He identifies with Christ. He stands under the allegiance of his Savior, Jesus Christ. And so he's been, he's been excommunicated to this island. No way to get off. And that's where God places him. He's old now. He is the last of the apostles to be living. The others have passed away. John is the last one to, to be alive. We don't know how he dies. There's tradition that tells us, but the scriptures simply don't tell us. So we don't know. Maybe here on the island, maybe after. We don't know that for sure. John has written many scriptures, as we see here in the Word of God. And so they give us a picture. They give us a clue. There, there are different styles, different genres that we would use. And yet there's a, co there's a cohesion. There's a, there's a continuity to his book. So let's just see this real quick because it's important as we move into the book of Revelation. The Gospel of John, which we just finished, just as a reminder, John in, that, in the Gospel, he calls us to believe an eyewitness account of the life of ministry. He calls us to faith in Christ. He calls us to recognize and to acknowledge and to place Jesus Christ as Savior on the throne of our heart, to be number one, that He is divine, He is the Son of God. He writes, he writes three letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, letters to real people, real situations. In 1st John, He calls us to be sure of our salvation. He calls us to faith in the Gospel of John. And then he calls us, he says to us, we can know. I write these things to you who believe, Gospel of John, in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Profession of faith is not enough. John says, he wrote a whole book, one whole book of the Bible, to us, to give scrutiny to our faith. We might know with assurance that Jesus Christ is our Savior. If you're not sure this morning of Jesus Christ is your Savior, I would encourage you to read this book. And are the qualities that Jesus says are true of a believer, are those qualities in your life? In the epistles of 2 John and 3 John, he emphasized this, walking in the truth. I rejoice greatly to find that some of your children are walking in the truth as was commanded by the Father. And I have no greater joy than to hear that you are walking in the truth. My children are walking in the truth. And, and so John calls us not only to believe, he calls us to have an assurance um, a settledness of heart. He says, you can know. And then he calls us to walk consistently, faithfully, to walk in the truth, that the truth of God's Word would define us. And then it brings us to Revelation, the book that we're going to be jumping into. And at the end of this book, John writes these words, He who testifies to all to these things, all these things, that's Jesus, says, Surely, surely I am coming soon. And then John adds these words, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And he calls us to be ready. Jesus is coming. He could come at any time. He could come today. He could come this week. Are you ready? Revelation is about the believer. It is, are you ready? Are you, for, are you ready to be with the Lord? Are you ready for what's coming? Do you have a relationship with Christ? We have to consider that in Revelation there are, there are uh, more Old Testament references than any other book in the New Testament. It is grounded on the Old Testament. Specifically, it is a convergence of, of all the prophecies that were ever written. All the promises that were written, they are, they are fulfilled here in the book of Revelation. They are ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. It is, it is a, a book of real hope to see Jesus Christ, to see God finally bring to completion everything that we are longing for, looking for here from the Word of God. It is grounded in the Old Testament. Specifically, it's tied directly to Daniel. We see, we see Daniel, Revelation, Together, it's a tether. It's tied directly. We're going to see that. And, of course, uh, one thing is you look at Revelation. You see symbolism. You see word pictures. You see all these things. You see numbers. Numbers are, are very essential in the book of Revelation. The number seven over and over and over again, for example. There are some key essentials that we need to understand as we come to the book of Revelation. How do we interpret it? Uh, what's the choices that we're going to make? Uh, there are four main approaches to, to the to the book of Revelation, how we how we approach it. One one is this: is that all, everything that happens in in the book of Revelation was fulfilled in John's day, in the at the time of Rome, or or after, like the first century or the fifth century when Jerusalem finally fell, 
or AD 70 in the first century. But but uh, these are called preterists. They would see they would see the the book of Revelation have already been completed. We're kind of in the kingdom now. Uh, the second one would be looking at the seven churches of Revelation and seeing Revelation unfold through those seven churches, and that those seven churches reflect uh, the the prophetic program that we see in Revelation. So everything that happens in Revelation is found in the history of the church. Well, of course, there's no there's no exact way to, to correlate what's happened in the church around the world and in America with the prophecies in Revelation. There's just not a tie. There's not a fit. It just can't work. A third approach is is to look at the symbolism and to look at the, the word pictures and to, and, and to understand and to see that Revelation is a book that's symbolic. It, it speaks to simply the the ongoing real battle between good and evil. And so this approach spiritualizes everything that's in the book of Revelation. It allegorizes everything that's in Revelation. It doesn't see historical time periods and historical and, and literal promises in the future. It just sees those things as being um, a symbol of good and evil, and good and bad. Uh, they're just timeless truths, they're principles, and yet they fall apart because when you read Revelation, you simply see that there are specific promises, there are specific time frames that God lays out. That can't, that can't fit into a, a, a symbolic approach only. The fourth approach is simply to understand that, especially in, in chapter um, 6 and moving forward, it is, it is uh, uh, speaking to the end times, to future promises that are going to be fulfilled, that we're on the precipice of seeing God fulfill. There are, there are different approaches to this number four, and, and we'll be talking about some of those. Those are the main styles. We, we land at number four because, because we approach the Word of God uh, consistently from a literal point of view. We look at it historically and, and grammatically. We look at it from a literal point of view, and we understand that as, as the Word of God was written, the authors wrote what they intended for us to see. And so we're to look at the language, the grammar, and we're to understand it from, from their point of view. What was the author's point of view? What was, what was it he was conveying? and What did he desire for the audience that was receiving it to understand? And so we try to pick up that meaning and understand that meaning and, and then bring that application into our life. And from that we come to the conclusion that, that Revelation is clearly speaking of things that are yet to be fulfilled in fulfillment of really the Old Testament, the promises, the prophecies that were given. And so we come here to, um, to the book of Revelation and we see, we see three styles of writing. In, in, uh, in verse 1 we see an apocalyptic uh, point of view. We see an apoc apocalyptic approach to, to the scripture. We're going to come back to that in just a second. Uh, the apocalypse was basically, the Jews wrote very much uh, apocalyptic literature and materials. And this kind of writing, this kind of genre, this style of writing was often very indicative of going through great suffering, great persecution. And it was, it was the, the, the writing of this literature was the hope that God would deliver them from that time. Uh, those writings were often very rich in symbolism. It was for many reasons. One was to protect the writer, to protect those who who were caught with the, with the literature in their hands, uh, that that um, those who caught them wouldn't be able to understand everything that was written, and they would see it as sub, sub, uh, subversive to the to the king, to the emperor, to the culture, to the one who's in charge. Um, and the word itself, uh, apocalypsis, simply means to reveal, and so that's where we get the name for the for the book that we are studying. Revelation or revelation. It is a it is a revel, is it a revelation. It is an uncovering. It is it is something that that man can't discover. That God chose to reveal to uncover because He chose to do that. Now we are now we are able to see information and understand that information because God revealed it. So this is a revealing from God is what we see. It is prophetic in chapter in verse three. We see that we're going to see that this morning. Uh, it's a proclamation of promises, God's promises, literal promises that he gives to his people. It's important. There are symbols, for sure, in the prophecies and in the book. But the symbols that we see here point to literal, specific promises. With a time stamp, with a time frame, it's really important that we understand that and we see that. Um, and then only this, not only this, we see that Revelation is a letter. So it kind of is three different styles of writing in, in one book. It is a letter written to specific real churches, 
and that is important, churches who existed in Asia Minor, it's written to those churches specifically, but yet it's also by extension written to the church and to us today. We're going to see that as well. And so it's a, it's a love letter from God, from His heart to His church, to the church, and to these seven churches specifically, and we're going to see that. What's the purpose of, of Revelation? Well, there's a couple purposes here. Because it's a letter, it's written to churches. It's written to, to encourage. It's written to challenge. It's, it's written to bring hope. God, God wants to move the heart of believers in these churches and in His church today. He wants to move our hearts to live for Him. He wants to move our hearts so that we would walk in truth according to, what, Second John and Third John? He wants us to have assurance he wants us to know and to walk faithfully with Him. Holy living, we see here in uh, verse 3. It is to reveal the end, God's program, and how He's going to complete that. The consummation of God's promises, the consummation of all things. It is to reveal that, the kingdom of God. And it's to reveal not only the plan of God, but the plan of God through specifically through Jesus Christ. It is about the preeminence of Jesus Christ. He is preeminent here in the book of Revelation. Often, often when we read this book, we kind of get bogged down. We focus on the events. We focus on the sensationalism. We focus on the, on the details. We focus on all these things, and, and they're really important. I mean, God gave them to us for a reason. But behind all of those things, there is a purpose that is higher than, than those, and it is about Jesus Christ. He is preeminent in all this. So let's look at that. Let's see that. Let's understand that. Let's grab a hold of that. That picture is really important. Christ is the centerpiece of the book of Revelation. In chapters 1 through 3, he is exalted, and he's ministering to the church. He, he is exalted. He has ascended into heaven. Now John gives us this picture of our exalted, our ascended Savior, and he is in a different capacity here now. Now he's the head of the church, and he is ministering to the church that he loves and bought with his own blood. Chapters 4 and 5, he is, he is glorified. Uh, he alone is worthy. We're going to see that. In chapters 6 through 8, he is sovereign. The Lamb in, the, in chapter 4 and 5 is identified also as the Lion. And that Lion then, then is seen in action in chapters 6 through 18. Uh, the Lamb becomes the Lion. He pours out judgment. He is a conqueror in chapter 19. And he overwhelms darkness. He did that at the cross Yet with finality, he will, bring, he will bring the conclusion of the cross to finality here at the end of Revelation. And he will overwhelm sin and darkness with finality. Chapters 20 to 22, we see that he is king. He's king over his eternal kingdom. And he is judge. He is judge over all things we see in chapter 20. Over all people, he will be the final judge to whom we will give account. In chapters 21 and 22, we see that Jesus Christ, He is co-equal with God. He is reigning with God for all eternity. We see that divinity of Jesus Christ and that co-equal element, Him with the Father and ultimately with the Spirit as well. And we see this quality so important to our heart, so, so much strength to our heart that He's faithful. He's coming again. And so Revelation really is about Christ. And I'm glad to say that. I'm glad to communicate that. Because... The ministry of the church, the ministry of Emmanuel, the ministry of a believer today, it's all about Christ. The Word of God is consistent all the way through. And as Revelation shows us an end that is coming, it is showing us our hope in Jesus Christ. It is showing us not only what He is going to do, but what that means for you and I today, as you live today, this week in 2020. So let's break Revelation down. We're going to go to this verse later. As we move through the text, chapter 1, verse 19, we just see briefly this. John speaks to things that he has seen, things that have been, thing, things that have taken place. What has he seen? We're going to see that. He sees in, in, in also in chapters 4 and 5 things that are, things that are happening now as he's writing. Okay, And then in chapter 6 to the end of the, of the book, he speaks to things that are to take place. So what is he, what is he seeing here? Well, in, in this first section, he's seeing Christ, and he's seeing Jesus Christ while wow, he is transformed. He is not the Jesus that I, that I encountered and walked with for three years. He is so different. He is, so, he is beyond words, and, and, and John falls at his feet, and, and we, see, we see such a different relationship that John has with the Savior because Jesus Christ is, is glorified. 
Jesus himself is transformed. We're going to talk about that. Not only that, in chapters 4 and 5, as we look at Christ, we see that he, he is worthy to transform this world. Revelation is about Lord, the Lord transforming this world. Human history. And he does that because he is worthy. John's going to show us that. And then he is the agent of transformation. He is the one who will bring about the transformative work that's going to take place and is revealed here in the book of Revelation. It is all about Christ. From his time and coming to earth and living among us and going to the cross, his work has always been about transformation. New life in Christ. Revelation shows the completion of that work. We're going to see that as we go through. I'm pretty excited. So Revelation really is about the Lord. It's, it's the Lord's transformation of history. It's His story. It's what Jesus Christ is going to do. He's going to, he's going to transform completely this world. Humanity, the kingdom, He's going to transform everything. Nothing will be as it was. Nothing will be as it is now. Jesus Christ is going to transform. So I want to look here this morning at the first part. Let's look briefly at, these, at the first part here. We're going to move into this, into this text and we're going to start this, this first emphasis. The things, the things that I have seen, John record. Here's the things that I have seen. This is what I have seen. Okay? In verses one, chapters one through three, and in verses one through three. It's going to be important here. And so what we see here is that Jesus is indeed has been transformed. We're going to encounter that in later verses, but this becomes the emphasis of chapter one, two, and three. He has been transformed. It's a beautiful thing. You know, we think of transformation, we always think of, you know, the butterfly when a, when a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. I mean, what a beautiful picture. It's a beautiful picture of salvation. It's a beautiful picture of what takes place. We need to realize that Jesus Christ went through transformation, not once, but twice. You see, he was that, he was that beautiful butterfly, as it were, in that word picture. And, and he, he uh, experienced and was in, in full essence and nature God. And he was reigning with God. And he was eternal with God. And he was, has always been God. And then he stepped out of, that, out of that form of a butterfly and he came down and he took on the form of a caterpillar. He, he took on that corn. He, he, he became incarnate in the flesh, born of a virgin. And he took on sin upon himself. And he took on the cost and the price of sin upon himself. And, and usually we think of transformation, how beautiful it is. But that first step that he took was was, an, was a, an ugly one. It was a terrible one that he took. He set aside his glory and his divinity uh, as far as expressing it to humanity in, in, in its fullness. And he set aside his reputation. He set aside all those things and he became a servant. And he served us by taking your sin and my sin upon himself. And when he finished that work on the cross, then that transformation takes place again. When he rises from the dead, that transformation takes place again. And now he's, now he's at the right hand of the Father. And together they rule and they reign. And Jesus Christ is coming again. And what he did with his life, he will do in our life as well. Revelation. It's connected to Daniel directly. We need to see this and understand this. Chapter 2, chapter 7. Let's look at this chapter 2 this morning. Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, has a dream. He can't interpret it. Daniel's brought. Daniel's able to interpret it through God's wisdom. There is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has made known to the King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. He who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. What is to be. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. And this ties us directly to Revelation. Dur Revelation directly will fulfill what's taking place here in chapter 2. And we see the statue in the various kingdoms and ultimately the kingdom of God, which crushes all of the others. We see God being sovereign. He's in charge. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and he sets up kings. And that's what he's doing here in Revelation. That's what he's doing in history. That's what he's doing right now. But as Daniel writes, God gives him this commandment, this instruction. Chapter 12, verse 4. But Daniel shut up the words and sealed the book until the time of the end. You need to, sh you need to close the book. Write no more because it's not time yet. It's not time for me to come. It's not my timetable yet for this to take place. We're going to seal the words until the time is ready. We come to Revelation. We come to John as he writes in chapter 22, verse 10. And he said... 
He, the angel, the angel said to me, John, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Open it up. Do not seal this prophecy. Revelation 1.1. These things must soon take place. We're on the precipice of that. God could come at any time. Yes, it's been 2,000 plus years, but we need to remember this from 1 Peter chapter 3. We've got to remember that God's timetable is not our timetable. It's not our timetable. One day is like a thousand years, but from God's perspective, a thousand years is like one day. From that perspective, it's been two days since the cross, a little over. God's perspective, his timetable is so vastly different than ours. But there's a reason, there's a reason that only he understands. There's a timetable that he only stands, he only understands. But you know what? God is waiting to bring this to completion, and I believe he could come at any time. I believe this timetable and revelation, boom, could happen right now. But there's a reason he's waiting. It's because he's gracious. He wants, he wants us to come to Christ. His desire is that people come to Christ. He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. And ultimately, all those that are chosen or all those that are brought into a relationship will come. And when that last one receives Jesus Christ, that, time, that clock will drop and this timetable will start and Jesus will come again. So let's look at our text today. Revelation chapter 1. I want to look at these three verses briefly this morning. Verse 1, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, okay? The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. What we see here in this, in this, in this text is simply this. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. We see the revealing of Jesus Christ, the title of the book. The uncovering, the revealing of Christ. Now there's a question here. There's two options as to what John's, what does he mean when, he's, when he uses this phrase? I mean, right away as we, the first phrase of the book, we have to, we have to make a choice here. We have, to, we have to give understanding to what's going on here. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, the first words, the first phrase. Is this the revelation of Jesus Christ? In the sense, the sense here is this, that this is, the revealing comes from Jesus. Jesus is the one who's communicating. Jesus is the ambassador. Jesus is the messenger. Jesus is the mouthpiece. And so in that sense, this is what John's talking about. Jesus is the communicator. He's the one who's talking here. So it's the revelation from, from Jesus Christ. That's one way to express it. That's one way to see it. Okay? It's important. And so we see here in John 17, 8, Jesus himself said, Every word that I say comes from the Father. You have... I have given them the words that you gave to me. They have received them. They have come to know in truth that I came from you. They believe that you sent me. And these verses here indicate that. As you look at verse 1, you see the sequence here. You see God gave Christ words, this revelation. God gave them to Christ. Okay? And Jesus gave them to, to an angel at the end of verse 1. The angel gave it to John, his servant, at the end of verse 1. John gives it to all of his servants at the beginning of verse 1. We see that sequence. It goes from God to Jesus to an angel to John to us. It doesn't follow that sequence perfectly all the way through Revelation. At times we see Jesus speaking directly. We see God speaking. We see an angel speaking. We see different messengers. But we see the sequence here. Jesus is, is communicating the words of his Father, the revelation of his Father. But more than that... It is, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's important as well. Verse 8, it is said of Jesus, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. That's a clear reference to Jesus Christ. The revelation isn't just from the lips of Jesus Christ. The revelation is about Jesus Christ. Revelation is Christ-centered. The book of Revelation is Christ-centered. They both are true. Verse 2, we see this. And so John bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. And even to all that he saw, what did he see? He saw Christ, the risen Christ, the ascended Christ, the glorified, the transformed Christ. This is what he sees. But the words here are important. It says, John bore witness to the word of God. And and he bore witness to the testimony of Jesus Christ. Those two words come from the same Greek word, martureo. We saw that in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. We're going to see that in a second. 
is, it is the word for, for martyrs. And what we see here is this. John bore witness to the word of God. He was a martyr for the word of God. He was exiled for the word of God. Maybe he gave his life there on that island for the word of God. We are called in Acts 1.8 to go into all this world. Jesus Christ, and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to the martyrdom of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ gave up his life for us. The two words are exactly the same in the Greek. They, they give us that, the sense of this next emphasis from, from the book of Revelation. It's not only about the revelation of Jesus Christ, about Jesus Christ himself. It's about the cost of identifying with Christ, the cost of identity with Christ. There's always a cost to take on the name of Jesus Christ. Because we are, we are proclaiming Christ in a sinful world. He is light and the world is dark. He is holy and the world is sinful. When we take on the name of Christ, we identify with Christ. He becomes our Savior and Lord. And we walk with Him in truth. Then it's going to have impact. It's going to ripple into our life. There's going to be a reaction and impact backed against us. And there's a cost. There will be persecution against believers of all generations. Because the world hates the message of truth and hates Jesus Christ. Acts 1-8 reminds us we're called, we're called to be witnesses. We're called to be martyrs. We're called to pick up, to accept, and to identify with the cost of being a believer, of standing in Jesus Christ. We're called to say, you know what? The best thing in this world is to know Jesus Christ as Savior. And whatever that costs me, I'm going to pay that cost. I will gladly lay down my life for my Savior, for my Lord Jesus Christ. Not only that, we come to verse 3 and we see this. Not only does the revelation speak specifically of Jesus Christ as the revelation of Christ, not only is, is John going to emphasize the impact that it has on the life of a believer, there is a cost to identifying with Christ. But he's going to show this as well. Verse 3, Blessed is the one. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. It is a prophecy. It is a, it is a prophetic book. It is, it is literal, and its time is near. But John shows us very specifically here, and that's what makes this book unique. He gives us this sense of blessing, this clear sense of God's favor on the life of anyone who reads, and ultimately is, who reads aloud, is referring to reading it in his church reading it in the synagogue, reading it, reading it to, the, to the believers, reading it faithfully, reading it out loud so that we can hear it, because not everybody had a copy of the Word of God in their hands, but simply reading it from our life as well and encountering it, reading it and then, and then hearing it and believing. And so, and so the third area of emphasis here in, in Revelation in this section is this. It's, it's about Christ. It's about living for Christ, identity with Christ and, that, and the cost, and it's about the blessing of Faithfully walking with Christ. John 10.10 10 just reinforces that sense of blessing, God's favor. He says, I came, I came that you would have just great joy in your life, that it would be abundant, that it would just pour out into your life. Um, what, what a joy. You know, the thief comes to steal, steal and to kill and destroy. And, and that's a challenge to you and I this morning as we're listening. Is, is the adversary, has he, has he just brought chaos into your life? What, has he killed and destroyed uh, a passion for Christ in your life, vitality? Has he killed joy in your life? Is, is, is he wrecking havoc in your personal faith and your personal delight in Christ? Jesus says, I came to overcome that. I came to bring joy. I came to bring grace. I came to bring life in Christ. And it's through relationship. We're reminded by Paul in Ephesians 1.3 that every blessing that we've ever had, it's in Christ. It's in relationship. Anything good that will ever come into my life that is life-changing is from Christ. And it is, it is stored in, in heaven with Him. The riches of heaven are ours. The blessings of Christ in heaven are ours. All of them. He, he gives us in totality all of those blessings. They are spiritual in nature. They are divine. They are enabling. They are power. They are all those things. And ultimately, they are grounded in the hope that we have in Christ. He brings us joy and He brings us peace. That's blessing. And it's grounded in, in the hope that comes by believing His Word and believing the testimony of Jesus Christ. It comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. Abundant life comes because I believe God. And no matter how hard my life is, and no matter what discouragements I have in my life, I am lifted in my spirit. I'm lifted in my soul because I believe God. And the Spirit of God becomes 
power in my life to bring joy. And so I abound in, in hope. Revelation ultimately is a context for relational ministry. We've been talking about relational ministry. It's so important that Christ flows out of your life. It is so important that we see the people in our life and we engage them for Christ. It is so significant that that takes place. Revelation is about the end times. Revelation is about things that are going to take place. But Revelation is about Christ in our life today. Revelation is about the hope that the future brings and how that hope resonates into how we walk in holiness today and how we engage people who need the Lord today with that message of hope and of assurance of truth. It is relational. Revelation is, is the context. We are in the end times. We've been looking at the last three weeks at, at how the, the Word of God speaks prophetically to the, how, what the heart of man is going to look like in the end times. Our ministry is going to be difficult. It's going to be hard. It's going to get harder. It's going to be more difficult. And yet the joys are going to be greater and clearer because we're going to see the grace of God in opposition opposition to, to uh, uh, the, the rejection against Christ. We're going to see the Spirit of God open hearts. We're going to see the, the light of the Word of God come on by the Spirit in hearts. We're going to see hearts changed and transformed. And God's going to use you to make a difference. Believe that. He wants to use your life to reach people in your family, your neighbors, people around you. It is a context for relational ministry. These three verses, even right here, it, is, it sets the tone for the rest of the book. These are the emphases that we see in the rest of the book. How important is that? It is that context. And there's basically three areas of emphasis here. Are you in relationship? It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Are you in relationship to Christ? Do you know Him? Do you know Him as Savior? Do you love Him with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind? Do you wake up with an anticipation to be with the Lord and to meet the Lord and to talk with the Lord, to commune with the Lord, to be right with the Lord, to have a clear conscience with the Lord? Are these things that are, are they resonate from your own heart in that relationship? It's important. He calls us a servant. Are you a servant of the Lord? Will you accept the cost of identity? It's not going to be easy to live for Christ today. It's not easy in your own family. To speak the truth of the Word of God, to speak the truth of relationship in Christ into your own family is often very difficult. To speak it to your neighbors, to your co-workers, to speak it in a culture that puts intense, life-changing pressure on those who would dare to speak out fills us with fear and intimidation, and that God comes along and He instills us with uh, faith, and He instills us with the power of the Holy Spirit to take that stand and to resonate the message of Jesus Christ through our life and to proclaim it, to speak it, and to live it, to say, the Lord is mine no matter the cost. Because I care for people, I'm going to share Christ. And he, and he says in verse 3, he speaks of the blessing that the, word of, that the revelation is in our life. Ultimately, the Word of God. Your life is at a celebration to others. That's part of sharing the Gospel. Sharing the Gospel is not just the message of hope. It's not just the message of truth. It's not just the message of our need for a Savior. Sharing the Gospel is a message of life change, that Jesus Christ has changed me. And everything about Christ is positive. And everything about Christ in my life is positive. And so I convey with my life. I convey with the joy of the Lord in my life. And I convey with a, with a mindset of grace that flows from my life. I convey all these things. Because my life is a celebration of what Christ has done. Is your life a celebration of Christ? Do others bump into your life and see joy? And do they see grace coming from you? Do they see a changed life coming from you? Do they want the Christ that is projected from your life? Do they want the relationship with God that they see from your life? Do they see the victory? Do they see the good things that Jesus Christ is doing in your life? That's the gospel. May our life, our message, have the power of our life under the submission of the Holy Spirit. May God work in our heart as we begin this book. I'm looking forward to it. A transformative work of our Savior. 
transformative uh, work of His grace, His love. He, our Lord, transforming history and transforming us today in His church. May revelation touch our hearts, I pray. Lord, begin to do a work in us. Help us to draw into this book with hope and expectation, with accountability, uh, with mission from you into our life. May you task us with commandments from the Word of God, with character from the heart of Christ into our life. And may it flow from our, our life and may grace and love and the celebration of relationship pour from our life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us. I invite you to stay connected as we move through this book. Share this with someone. Invite someone to come along. Let's learn together. Let's anticipate together. Let's look at Christ together. Let's, let's look at our culture through the lens of relationship with Christ. May the Lord bless you as you walk with Him. Amen and amen.